Okay, we might get started. Uh, my name is Sarah Joseph and I'm the director of the Caslin Centre. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Kulin, um, people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we have gathered today and pay my respect to, respects to their elders past and present. Uh, as has become customary, the Caston Centre will be tweeting this event. I actually hope that is okay with our speaker, I'm not sure we asked you. Um, so if you are interested in uh, capturing the event on Twitter, the hashtag is hashtag CC Apartheid. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce our speaker and then um, we'll um, pass over uh, to Henny who will um, talk for about half an hour. Then we'll have a little chat about what he's been saying and then we'll pass it over to questions. Uh, Henny Van Vuren is a South African activist and writer. He is the director of Open Secrets, which is a non-profit organisation based in Cape Town that investigates and seeks accountability for economic crimes, abuse of power and human rights violations. He's also worked as the director of the Institute for Security Studies in Cape Town and for Transparency International in Berlin. And he is the co-author of the, de the, de the Devil in the Detail, How the Arms Deal Changed Everything. Uh, Henny today, his talk is entitled Apartheid Guns and Money, A Tale of Global Profit, and he's really going to be addressing who secretly supported the last white regime in South Africa and who profited from it, and what could be done to hold economic crim criminals to account um, when they have escaped justice to date. So please, rec uh, please welcome Henny Van Burt. Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that introduction and to the Kasten Centre for hosting this, um, this evening. I think we've got about an hour and I'm going to use 20 or 30 minutes to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about the work that my colleagues and I do at an NGO called Open Secrets based in South Africa. And, uh, and then Open allows some time for us to have uh, some discussion and, and questions as well. And I'd really like to encourage that as, as part of, uh, of what we're doing here today so that I'm not only talking uh, to you but with you as well this evening. Um, as Sarah has mentioned, I work for a non-profit organization called uh, Open Secrets and we investigate economic crime involving primarily private actors in the banks and the financial sector. Um, we focus on uh, those crimes that have a direct impact on human rights. And um, our focus is not only in the investigation process and unearthing this, but it's the process of truth-telling, a process of advocacy and getting the message out and so I, I guess this is part of bringing others into those conversations and lastly it's uh, litigation or legal strategies and so we kind of try to think, I'm not a lawyer myself so I'm just, if I get it wrong I've got it wrong, uh, but we work with lawyers in our team and what we, we do is we try and um, build the legal arguments through our investigations of how we can hold actors to account where I think we have great difficulty, not only in South Africa, but around the globe, of trying to ensure that the banks, the enablers of corruption, the accountants, maybe good accountants amongst you, the lawyers, and certainly are good lawyers amongst you, uh, but we know that in many of the big firms in this city and other cities around the globe, there are people who profit from human rights violations. And it's those folks we're interested in, because very often, uh, I think we could argue that our, our political elites, our institutions, have lost the interest or don't have the capacity to tackle a lot of those crimes. And, and I think we'd argue it's up to civil society and uh, folks in academia and elsewhere to make not only the argument but present the evidence to, to, to do precisely that. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, my book, Apartheid Guns and Money, um, but I thought, you know, maybe just firstly let me say it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be in Australia. It's the first time I've certainly been here and to be in, in Melbourne um, with you this evening. Uh, I came to uh, Australia for the first time last week as a, as a guest of the Australian Human Rights Institute and um, at the University of New South Wales they hosted a conference on business and human rights um, and it was great to be able to attach this meeting to that and we were speaking a little bit about the role of finance uh, in human rights violations and I learned a little bit about the Royal Banking Commission so I hope we can get a chance to speak about those things and, uh, and the connections to, to um, Australia as well. I also want to recognize, before I start this conversation, in talking to you about our research, the Party Guns and Money was published uh, in South Africa in 2017, but in the UK last year and 
uh, through Hearst and this year um, Oxford University Press have just published it in, in the United States. So in a way it's only fresh in the shelves outside of South Africa for the last couple of months. So maybe tell you about the research, about some of our findings. Um, it's a big book and I'm not going to bore you with too many details, but perhaps talk about what for us were some of the major revelations, how we came to to undertake the research, and I say we, it's really a team of researchers that were working uh, together with me. It takes a village to really build a child, and if you want to, if any, any author stands up and says, I wrote the book, that's the first moment where you should stop believing in them, I would argue. But also to recognize, being in Australia, um, we're going to talk about the network of people who supported the apartheid regime and this racist regime in South Africa for many years to stay in power, to enable the oppression of the majority of South Africa's people, black South Africans, and equally to wage many of the wars in Southern Africa. Um, but also to recognize, of course, there was a very powerful anti-apartheid movement, and an important leg of that was in Australia. I'm not going to talk about that, um, and that isn't because I think those voices aren't important, but I guess we're trying to uncover the, the underbelly, the darker side that has remained hidden for a very long time. But at recognizing, I think, Australian politicians um, like Gareth Evans, uh, Bob Hawke, and many others who, within the trade union movement, had been um, active uh, members of the Australian anti-apartheid movement in Victoria and elsewhere, uh, the um, uh, the indigenous movements and the many ordinary South African, the many ordinary Australians rather, who showed their solidarity in in uh, challenging apartheid. I think it's important for us just to recognise that because while apartheid was clearly probably one of the um, the clearest examples of uh, not only structural racism but of a system that was pernicious, that lasted for decades and was designed to oppress the, the majority of a country's people over many decades in the 20th century. Um, the global anti-apartheid movement, if you like, was the countenance to that. I mean, how extraordinary to have a global movement of people in solidarity around the world to, to tackle one of the world's biggest, uh, one of the biggest, world's biggest issues. And I think we draw very many important lessons from, from that work and those struggles. So some of the things, and I'm just going to show a couple of, I've got a, uh, a couple of slides, and which are all uh, graphics from the book. You may not be able to read all of those, and then that's fine um, as well, but uh, I think it's just to give you a sense of some of the information that we, that we have in the book. Um, and I think if you see the little box at the bottom, some folks may be joining us uh, by a video. By, by, by Zoom. By Zoom. Yeah. So it may come alive or it may not. But that oh, no, it shouldn't come alive, but we can't get rid of that. <laughs> okay, fine. So that's why that's there, in case you were wondering uh, why that's there. So I, I guess there, there are two things that I'd like to focus on this evening. Um, and the one uh, is the issues around white supremacy and the other around uh, that of global corruption. And they're both issues that confront us today. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you have your own struggles with notions of white supremacy in Australia. Um, uh, I, I mean, we know the name Peter Dutton in South Africa, I would argue. Uh, you know, the, the, sometimes it's, well, yeah, he's a politician, um, if you want to say, yeah, it's a politician that you've got to kind of question many of his, um, his, the remarks that he's made, but some of those include this idea that white South Africans generally and white farmers are facing a genocide in South Africa and therefore they above all should be preferenced in terms of uh, immigration in, into Australia. Um, and, and I think I would argue that um, some of those views and thoughts are really a continuation of the networks that would have been supportive of the apartheid regime. I'm not saying that he is a, was a supporter of apartheid, <laughs> but these are the kind of solidarity networks that continue in many countries around the world. We see um, p folks we may talk about around Donald Trump, for example, um, Roger Stone, who was implicated, he and others were, were in fact supporters of the apartheid regime, were paid to be lobbyists mm -hmm. for the apartheid regime and its proxies in Washington in the 1980s. And so these folks, I guess, are, um, are part of that network extended over time. And it's some of those networks that I'd like to, to, to talk about um, uh, as well as, as, uh, as we discuss some of these things um, tonight. And I'd also like to talk about a couple of myths. And, and the first of those was a myth we were confronted. So the book took about five years to, 
to write, investigate, research. Um, it didn't take five years to write it, but five years to bring it together. And in South Africa, there's a prevailing myth that right today, South Africa is, of course, a democratic country, 25 years of democracy. We've had our, um, our dem fifth democratic elections most recently uh, at the end of April. So it was, uh, it was only, uh, sorry, the beginning of May. It's only been a couple of weeks ago that we've had our elections. Um, and so it's a functional democracy, but it's a country that's deeply mired in corruption. Um, I think if you if you talk about South Africa, folks say, "Yeah, interesting country, good you know good sports teams," but that corruption problem seems to be endemic, very much like all other African countries. I'm not suggesting that that's what people say here in this meeting, but there's this notion that um, that the, the the issue of corruption is part and parcel of African governance and black-led gov governance. And from our perspective, I guess the argument is to try and problematize that. There's a, there's, this is a notion, I would argue, that it requires some disruption. Um, in South Africa, certainly the argument has been made by many that uh, corruption was something that was, was never part and parcel of the system of governance under apartheid. And of course, at its very core, the apartheid regime was a corrupt system. Effectively, what it was saying was, there are a couple of people, white folks, we're going to give them the majority of the country's resources. And in a way, it's no different from other forms of patronage um, that exist in, in other places around the world. We weren't looking so much at that element of the patronage system, but the question was, from the late 1970s until, from roughly 1977 until the early 1990s, international sanctions were placed on the apartheid regime largely through the work of the global anti-apartheid movement, blocking the sale of weapons to the regime. And somehow the South African regime not, not only managed to survive, it did manage to thrive throughout that process. It went from being um, a net arms importer in the mid-1970s to being the world's 10th largest arms exporter in the late 1980s. And so did this by not only domestic ingenuity, but clearly by support and collaboration from a network of actors around the globe. Who were those actors? The country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which sat in the late 1990s, headed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, often heralded as this you know, extraordinary example of a truth-telling process that yielded um, reconciliation. I guess there's a younger group of South Africans today that question the reconciliation that it yielded, but equally there are a younger group of South Africans, and I guess I may be in my mid-40s, but I kind of count myself as one of those who started to ask the questions if it told us all of the truth. It identified many of the policemen carrying the batons and the, 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 um, the murderers and torturers whose names are very well known in South Africa, but it didn't necessarily explain structurally the network of people in a country like South Africa and globally who profited. Um, from from the regime. Not very dissimilar, I guess, to other truth commissions around the world. If you think about truth commissions, and I guess there may be people here who have studied some of those, um, there are very few of those have focused on the role of the economic elites. So the folks in the lawyers and the accountants, the big banks, the arms companies, the intelligence agencies, those are usually the ones that are right off the table. It's easier to focus on people in the armed services, maybe a general or two, a handful of politicians, and that gives us a semblance of justice. And I think it gives victims an understanding uh, that they require of what happened to their family members, and therefore it plays an important role um, in healing, and certainly was the case in South Africa. But the structural problems, that is a much harder, harder issue to crack. And certainly wasn't something that South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, uh, I would argue, was effectively um, able to do. Right now, or until recently, the, the Tunisian Truth and Dignity Commission, I know, was trying to look at the issue in the wake of the, of the revolution in their countries, was looking at some of these issues. And, you know, speaking to the commissioner involved there, they said that because they decided to focus on, on economic crimes, that is why they had the biggest pushback from politicians. It's because the political elites mm -hmm. between the old and the new, the business elites, are often enmeshed. And it's really, this truth-telling has to have a limit. There has to be a line of where this is drawn. And I, and I guess this is, these are some of the things that we seek to challenge. So we started off with the premise, um, and I've been working on issues around the global arms trade and the injustices with other colleagues uh, perpetuated by the arms trade in terms of corruption, human rights abuses. Um, we started off this process trying to think, figure out how we could 
you know, find the documents that would tell these stories. And the first, you know, important point of this myth, the, you know, the myths in South African politics was those apartheid records have all been destroyed. In fact, you know, we, there's a, there is a truth to that. In the early 1990s, uh, Frederick de Klerk, just as he was given the Nobel Prize by the committee in Oslo, was signing off orders for trucks to drive out of South Africa's capital, Pretoria, to the outskirts of the city where documents were dumped in massive uh, furnaces, the big steelworks outside of the, the, the capital, and were burnt. Um, purely because the shredders broke down. They couldn't actually handle the volume of documents. Um, so there were, um, there were countless tons of documents that were destroyed, and those truths will never be able to, to get at. Um, but about five, seven years ago now, I sat down with some colleagues from a feisty South African um, nonprofit called the South African History Archive, and we started to figure out, ask the questions, what if we use the country's freedom of information law, which is there in terms of the constitution to try and gain access to those documents. Um, and I'm very glad to say that two of the lawyers who worked on that process are here this evening. Catherine Johnson, who is an Australian lawyer who was working in, in South Africa, and Tareen van Beek, who's sitting next to her, the green top, who is a South African lawyer who's now doing a PhD in Melbourne. So it was a, another element of some of the international solidarity. And they, together with another Australian lawyer who isn't here this evening, uh, worked tirelessly over five or six years in helping us to gain access to those documents. We found in the country's defense archives and elsewhere, in fact, were a treasure trove of documents that historians and researchers had never, had never actually consulted and had those um, declassified for the first time. Uh, those were um, uh, documents primarily from the military intelligence and other archives. Uh, we worked through probably about one to two million pages of documents, working through 25 uh, archives in seven or eight different countries. And they, these were the remnants of the past that we started to pull together, from the Stasi archives in East Berlin to dusty archives in Pretoria. But these things were being wheeled out a little bit like, you know, if you like carcasses to you, anyone who's worked in an archive, I mean, it's a pretty dull and boring experience, but quite extraordinary what you start to find um, after, after, you know, a period of working through this. And it really is just the hard work of the lawyers, an organization called Lawyers for Human Rights in South Africa, and Saha, who, who opened the doors for us, and then once the doors were open, it was just sitting down and trying to dig through. And that started to, to present to us the picture, and you've got a map up there which we call the Atlas of Apartheid. It represents um, about 50 countries around the, the globe who we were able to identify were all, ma were all major suppliers of oil or weapons to the apartheid regime. Australia isn't marked. Um, I was going through some notes before I came this evening, and um, you know, there was, we, I think the best we found was that the apartheid uh, government in one of the archives was selling drone technology to Australia which would have been in violation of, of the UN um, sanctions of the 1980s. But beyond that, we didn't find evidence. And I guess the important point to make is that this is only an indication of what was there. We obviously, you know, I mean, we could probably add another 30 countries to this based on what we think was there, but we can only do this based on, on the information that's at our disposal. And it tells us an extraordinary story because um, central to this group of, of countries that were supporting the apartheid re regime in busting sanctions. Recall, as I said, 1977, the United Nations Security Council meets in response to the uprising in Soweto. Thousands of students are in detention, are imprisoned. Steve Biko, a black consciousness ac uh, activist, is murdered in South Africa by, uh, by the regime. And the international community responds uh, through, this, through, the, through the sanctions um, process and at the same time the South African government has invaded occupied both Namibia and invaded Angola so South African troops are in southern Angola marching towards the, the country's capital and for that they need weaponry and as I said they simply didn't have those uh, much of those weapons and they needed to build this up and so the the tale of profit really is a story of the network of countries that were assisting and core to those were all five members of the United Nations Security Council. What became clear from, um, from, the, from the documents was that 
The United Kingdom, which we suspected in the United States, certainly was Reagan and Thatcher in control, so those the right the right wing governments in, in both those countries uh, um, at the time. Um, France, which we'll turn to, to shortly, we had a sense that that was the case, and crucially, um, Russia and China. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive because both Russia and China were were firmly communist. The apartheid government was firmly anti-communist. In fact, one of the cornerstones of the Christian national policy of the National Party in South Africa was anti-communism. Right? There was this the spectre of the red peril, the red threat, the invasion of South Africa. And I think you know it was amazing when these documents landed in front of us, um, which showed you know this this project and a process that carried on for years of buying weapons from Beijing, where the Chinese government, in fact, through the 1980s, were ramping up their sale of weapons to the apartheid state and importing, um, at the same time, weapons and other technology from, from, from the South Africans. So the, the importance of this is that we have all five members of the United Nations Security Council, the world's global police officers, if you like, who, who were who were intended to ensure that, you know, they were, they, were, they were there to ensure that these laws were enforced. They were the ones, amongst others, who were at the forefront of breaking, it, breaking them. And so, effectively, if you like, the cops were corrupt. Um, and this meant, and helps us then to understand why so many other countries were all part of this game. Whether it was Israel, which at, uh, by the mid-1980s, had was uh, where South Africa was one of the was probably the in one of the years the biggest foreign forex earner for Israel through the sale of weapons. South Africa was the primary destination for Israeli weapons, and the Israelis and the South Africans were developing nuclear technology, missile technology, um, drone technology. So drones would be developed in Israel, which is still a major export of, of drones, and then they would be tested by the South African troops in places like Angola and then re-exported uh, in Israeli operations uh, subsequent to this process. And people, you know, we've got do found documents of people like Ariel Sharon who travel then to, and to Angola with South African troops to, you know, to, to view these processes so that they would then feed back into, into what was happening in Israel and the suppression of, of, a, of, of the struggles in, in South Lebanon um, at the time. One of the stories you know, that just gives us, I guess, a flavor of, of much of what is happening. But I'd like to turn, perhaps, you know, without us working through this encyclopedically into every country around the world, maybe just talk about one or two case studies, which I'd argue help us to understand the nature of some of these networks, of what, what we've referred to as the, the deep state networks in the book. Um, and I'm showing you a picture. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes that photograph in the room. Uh, it's a, it's a, an activist who's been forgotten, not least in South Africa, a woman by the name of Dulcie September. She was murdered 31 years ago, uh, and she was the African National Congress, today the governing party in South Africa, and one of the leading liberation movements. Um, she was its their representative in Paris in the 1980s. Um, the ANC at that time operated very much, if you like, like a small NGO with solidarity from trade unions and church groups and faith groups and others, but it was a, it was a relatively, um, I, I mean, it, was a, it punched above its weight in, in terms of, of, of the extent of the network it, it, uh, it really had. Dulcie September came from Cape Town, where, where, uh, where I'm from, and um, herself had been imprisoned, had been tortured for her own anti-apartheid activities in the 1960s. She spent a, a close to 10 years in prison, some of that in solitary confinement, um, an incredibly brave and principled woman. She was a trained teacher and, um, and eventually went into exile in, in the United Kingdom and, and subsequently, after moving between the United Kingdom and Tanzania, was uh, sent to, to France by the ANC to represent it there in, Lux in countries of France, Luxembourg, uh, and uh, Switzerland. And one morning in March of 1988, she walks up to her office in a very ordinary building in, in Paris, an apartment block where, on the, I think on the fifth floor, walks up, this goes up the stairs, there's a, there's a lift, opens, she's about to open up the door and she's very conscious about security. There have been death threats, she's had threatening phone calls, she's got a handbag from what we know and her one arm, um, and she opens the door. And as she opens the door, she shot at least five times in the head. Uh, the gun of the silencer. Uh, 
And until today, we don't know who killed Dulcy September. 31 years later, there's a murder in the center of Paris. A funeral takes place some days later. There are thousands of Parisians strung the, street, the, 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 the streets carrying placards, and this is one of the photographs that were carried uh, around at the time. And right from the, from the get-go, I guess one of the questions, um, as much as this is a network of men we talk about this evening who involve many of these crimes, um, I guess Dulcie September was a person who accompanied me, my colleagues, for a long period while undertaking the, the research, because we always had a sense that she was onto something, but we had no idea exactly what she was doing. Her documents were taken very soon after her murder. We know that the French intelligence services went in, cleared out much of her documents. The person who replaced her as the ANC's representative, in fact, was a double agent for the apartheid regime, a man by the name of Solly Smith who was working within the ANC. Um, and he made, we believe, made sure that m the, many of the documents that may have remained too disappeared. And all we were left with was fragments in a, in a, in a couple of, of archives. And as we went digging through the archives, we found notes and scribbles. They were scribbles about the names of ships, the names of operations, CIA operations, a famous case in Australia in the early 80s, Nugan Hand, which some people may have heard about, which lives in the world of conspiracy theories, but the more you dig with conspiracies, you find connections. And I don't know if she found any connections to Australia, and I'm not su suggesting she is. I think we believe that Nugan Hand was a, said to be an Australian front, of, uh, a small bank operating in Australia that was channeling money for black, uh, black ops operations, uh, former uh, Vietnam intelligence officials were based in Australia. Um, but the question was, what was she really after? And very soon, working through the documents, we found the names of the ships she was looking at. They were found in recently declassified documents that showed that these ships were in fact transporting weapons to South Africa, carrying Chinese weapons, carrying weapons from, 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 uh, from different places. But one of the things we hadn't anticipated, this is a map of the center of Paris, and it shows you a couple of things. Um, but one of the things uh, it does show us, I'm just see if I, not sure if you can see that, but um, this is roughly where uh, Dulcy September was, uh, was murdered. Um, this is the French intelligence office. And I'm then just gonna go down, I'll take you through a tour of Paris, but <laughs> this is the South African embassy, uh, which is not far from the Eiffel Tower, and basically, if you like, kind of next door to the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, separated by a couple of blocks. It's a box, it's a building that still today looks a bit like a beehive, covered in metal, precisely to stop activists mm -hmm. throwing things at it, planting bombs, doing other things um, to protect those inside. And what we discovered working through these documents was that there was a secret floor in the South African Embassy, which housed officials of the South African state-owned arms company, Arms School. At any time, about 30 of those officials who, whose primary job was to bust sanctions. And so they were there for a period of almost 15 years. In the center, in the heart of Paris, I mean, they were in plain sight. Um, and the more we went, you know, the more we dug through this trail, it led us to come to understand that these officials, together with the heads of the South African military intelligence, would travel to Paris, and they would meet with a head, frequently, with the head of French intelligence, of the, uh, the French Foreign Service, the DGSE. They would meet uh, with, um, with emissaries of Jacques Chirac, who was later the state president, or the president rather, of France, who had been prime minister at that time, and they were doing deals. France was offering the South apartheid government the most sophisticated missile technology it had. It was the missile technology that it had not even given to its own armed forces yet, would be would offered the Mistral missile and others, were, were offered by a Congo Brazzaville, uh, uh, went to, to South Africa. Um, and that gives us a sense of the deep connection that, uh, that, that uh, took place and the, the deep connections that existed, rather, um, between some, some of these, uh, these characters and, and actors. It also led us, in fact, through a fascinating story, and I know, Sarah, I've got to watch my time, so but you'll give me a few more minutes <laughs> if you can. I know, yeah, no, right? <laughs> um, but it led us to a series of banks. And our question was, so if, they, if these weapons exchanges were taking place, how is the money being paid for? We figured out, based on records from South African Auditor General, that up to about 50 uh, billion Australian dollars uh, was, was used by the South African government to procure weapons internationally over a 20 year period. And that's just too much money to carry, you know, you can't carry that in, in brown envelopes and, and suitcases in this kind of 1970s murder mysteries. What you need are banks, 
And that led us on the trail of finding out who the banks were that moved the cash around. And through with the help of a Portuguese arms dealer who until today is claiming uh, he's 10% on a, on a famous uh, deal to sell helicopters to the apartheid regime, he still believes he needs to be paid out by the democratic government. He, through his many court cases, started to leave a trail of documents. And those documents led us to a series of banks in Belgium, uh, or two banks in Belgium and Luxembourg, who we believe were responsible for laundering up to 70% of that 50 uh, billion Australian dollars, so about 35 billion dollars. The banks are Credit Bank, KBC in Belgium, and Credit Bank Luxembourg. Most folks, I don't know if anybody heard about the, the, them in the room, not familiar, I don't go anywhere anyone does excepting folks in Belgium or Luxembourg, but they're some of the biggest banks in both of those countries. Some of the most powerful, very well connected to the Flemish uh, elite in, in, in Belgium. And um, the managers of the banks, we, through working through the, rec uh, the archives, we were able to, to uh, piece this together, were in fact firm supporters of the apartheid regime. They were helping to set up a clandestine pro-apartheid network in Europe in the 1980s, this white nationalist network, if you like, but very much from within the center of business of conservative uh, center-right politics, who they were modeling on the global anti-apartheid movement. And they built up a, this, what this, this slide shows us is an architecture that started in South Africa, spreads yeah, through Panama and Liberia where front companies were set up. The Panama papers told us that this stuff continues until today. And so we found the, um, the identities of about 120, 130 of those front companies. Um, and those were all linked to accounts, many of the numbered accounts that, uh, that were housed in, in Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a tax haven. I, I mean, I would argue there's something very criminal about the state of Luxembourg then as it is now. And so it was the perfect, um, it was the, it was the perfect conduit for moving this cash around the globe. The officials then would travel from, from Paris, from the South African embassy, go and collect their cash from there, and then travel to Geneva and elsewhere and do the deals, pay the, hand the money, the actual money over. The banks, though, enabled the network. They, they didn't only receive the cash. We believe the evidence shows the banks set up the, helped set up the front companies and, and um, met frequently with officials from, from, from arms corps. So in violations of UN sanctions, and we shouldn't forget that those wars in Angola lost, resulted in the loss of 100,000 people's lives. This in addition to what was happening in the 1980s in South Africa with tens of thousands uh, of South Africans, and particularly young black South Africans, who were imprisoned, were put in detention um, um, at the time. And so this kind of does start to bring us back, and as I, I move towards closing, this brings us to back to where we are today. Because um, this is part of what we would argue is the deep state network of banks, of account, of, well, I've said the accountants and auditors, but certainly the banks, the intelligence agencies, the arms companies and the middlemen who work for those arms companies, uh, who have acted in collusion in assisting the apartheid regime to survive. I mean, I, I think there's enough evidence to show that the apartheid regime might, um, the, the apartheid might have been brought to an end 10 years earlier if it wasn't the case for this. Certainly the international campaign to block the, the easy credit that the apartheid regime was used to for construction and otherwise, um, did its, its bit of making apartheid too expensive for South African corporations and others, but the assistance of these banks and others meant that the apartheid regime was able to survive for much longer than I think you know, it, it should have quite clearly um, and given the way they in, enabled most of this. But the legacy of this continues. And I'd like, to give you, I'd like to give you an example that leads to South Africa right now, right today. So today, Jacob Zuma, South Africa's former president for 10 years, a man deeply involved in corruption, and we can talk about attempts to tackle corruption in South Africa, is in court. So if you, if you go on to Twitter and you look for Jacob Zuma, you'd find, I guess, South Africans have woken up by now and they're tweeting. He is sitting uh, in court on ch with charge with corruption and bribery. It's not because of the more recent scandals of corruption, but related to a big arms deal that South Africa was involved in in the late 1990s. Shortly after Nelson Mandela was elected, the South African government decides to buy weapons, military equipment, primarily designed for peacekeeping operations. But very soon after that, what we found are large corporations from some of the world's biggest exporting countries, from Britain, British Aerospace, 
um, Saab from Sweden, um, uh, Leonardo today from uh, Eromaki from Italy, were all involved in trying to sell the apartheid regime weapons it didn't need, it couldn't afford. At a time when we were coming out of apartheid, the legacies of grinding poverty that so many people experienced, and HIV AIDS was claiming the lives literally of to 300,000 South Africans. The Treasury said there wasn't money for antiretrovirals, and those are lives that could have been saved. But instead, we bought submarines, attack helicopters, attack fighters, um, corvettes from these arms companies. And the evidence is there that this was done almost exclusively on the basis of bribery. Every single one of those corporations, and we've got, and I've, and I've worked with others for many, many years in this. We have detailed evidence how all those corporations bribed either the, the, the governing party, the ANC, by giving them money, or bribed individual politicians. But one of the politicians they bribed was a relatively low-level politician who was based in South Africa's eastern province of KwaZulu-Natal. He was the minister of tour tourism in that state. His name was Jacob Zuma. He'd been important in the struggle against the, uh, against the party. He'd spent 10 years in prison. But he was still, a, he was still, you know, he was a relatively junior uh, official. But they could see in him the prospect of someone that they need in future, a potential ally. And it's alleged, and we believe the evidence is strong, that they paid him a relatively paltry amount of fifty thousand Australian dollars uh, in order to ensure that if there was any attempt to investigate that this one particular arms company, Talis, one of the biggest arms companies in France. That they uh, would, that he would come to their rescue, and lo and behold, in 1999, at the end of the Mandela administration, Thabo Mbeki is elected president, and Jacob Zuma becomes deputy president, and so Talis has their man in the country's state house, if you like, in, in the union buildings, and what happens is that uh, um, Talis is able to rely on on um, Zuma for a period of almost 20 years. Uh, 15 years rather, to smash the country's democratic institutions. The National Prosecuting Authority, the Revenue Service and others were all defanged precisely because Jacob Zuma wanted to ensure that he would not end up in jail. What this did is this drew, drove South Africa further into the, into the hands of a sm relatively small network of corrupt actors who had decided to weaponize the country's state-owned um, uh, state enterprises, the entities, uh, to just extract cash, extract money. And we've seen this hyper level of corruption over the last couple of years. If you go back to who Talis is as a company, Talis is in the 1970s and 80s was known as Thompson CSF. And amongst Dulcie September's notes that we found that were still lingering in the archives were, was exactly Thompson CSF. We believe she was investigating this company at the time of her murder. We believe that companies like Thompson CSF were supporting the apartheid regime. We know that companies like Thompson CSF, after the end of apartheid, worked hard to corrupt the new regime. And the evidence is there that the result of this was that what was the promise of democracy and, demo and a strong human rights culture within our democratic institutions has effectively been, if you like, disassembled over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and I guess I'm ending there, and we can talk a little bit what we're doing to tackle some of this. So I'm gonna, there are hopeful notes, but I, I do want to give it time for opportunity for discussion. But I end there to say that the legacies are lasting. The, the involvement of these corporations and banks has had a profound impact on the landscape um, of, of, in South Africa, and if anything has fueled a culture of impunity. And, and really, I think what is crucial for us to do um, as civil society, as, as those of us who care about human rights, is to focus our lens not only on the individual perp perpetrators, but the, if you like, the far harder work of naming the corporations who are very central to those human rights abuses, exposing them, and, and finding ways to, to hold them to account. Thank you very much. Obviously, incredibly serious, but it was a bit uh, the way you wave, we weave that together was 
also a bit of a macabre novel in a way. Um, let me just start off um, by asking you, I mean, it seemed like, you know, when it comes to the, the very bad actors you were talking about, there were the arms companies and then facilitated them by the banks. Um, do you think that we are making, I mean, um, business and human rights is, is, is part of, is part of uh, my research and it's part of the research of quite a lot of people in the room. Do you think we make enough of a connection between banks and human rights? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I mean, I, I would argue we don't. I think we're failing at this. Uh, and I say we, I, I, can, I include myself in this collectively. I think we can all own this. I think that, um, I think we're told to be in partnerships with the private sector far too much. And that, that isn't because I'm against the private sector. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I was told to be in a partnership with a corrupt politician, uh, well, I wouldn't. But equally, somehow, we found it a lot easier for ourselves very often to imagine that if we're going to sit around the table with some of those corrupt actors, we're going to find the solutions. Um, and that's not because I think that, you know, I use a bank card, I tapped to get a coffee before I came here, so I, I realized that I too have reliant on banks. But equally, I think we, we, um, we recognize the role that banks have played in, in facilitating um, human rights abuses. But the issue that I raised in the beginning of the conversation around the ability of our regulators and the ability of our prosecuting authorities to tackle some of those crimes that they are limited. Now, I can't speak for Australia, um, but I do know you had the World Bank and Commission. I know that uh, uh, organizations regulate bodies like ASIC and others, from what I understand, were roundly criticized for their role. From what I understand, the, the, the role of banks here was profound in terms of the impact that it had over many years, over a number of people and working poor people mm -hmm. in particular. But at best, what happened to banks is they were fined, and at two executives, if I'm right, from some of the big banks, or maybe one, had, had resigned. But there were no executives who ended up in prison. No, and on the day that the findings were released, I think the bank shares went up because right. they, you know... There was stability in the market. Yeah, yeah well, they were, they, were, what they, were happy, they were happy with what was found, thinking that we shouldn't be too afraid. And so when we turn to, you know, I'm not talking just about other human rights abuses, I would argue that this network that we've shown you here probably continues to exist in other ways. Conflicts in South Sudan, uh, in Syria, in other countries around the world, we rely on banks to move that cash around. We focus far too little, I, I would argue, on the role of those economic, the big economic actors, because they, because they, they intimidate us, they're kind of darn scary, and they work very closely, precisely with this, this quite sinister network um, at times. And there is a culture of impunity. I mean, if we look at some of the big banking scandals from last year alone, one of the most important, important of those was um, a scandal that happened in a country that is ranked by Transparency International as the least corrupt country in the world, uh, which is Denmark. It's Denmark or New Zealand, generally those are two countries. Danske Bank, which is a, a very important bank in, in um, in Denmark was exposed through the work of investigators, investigative journalists and others to be involved in corruption, economic crime and a money laundering network to the value of about 230 um, billion euros. So it's a, it's a 230 million euros, so let me look at this one. But it's a, these, are, these are very big numbers that we're talking about. Um, and it was systemic, it took place over a period of about 10 years and there were no proper red flags that were raised over that period in a country that's perceived to have the best institutions to tackle corruption. I mean, I think that just kind of brings the message home. So, so I, I really, you know, I, I think that we are, um, I think we're in, a, in a far, we're in a far weaker position in terms of the international human rights community than, than, than we should be, and we, I think, need to be paying much more attention to these issues. I might just ask one more question and then throw it open to the audience, but is one of the problems, um, well, with these with these actors, may, well, probably some of the arms deals, um, but certainly the banks, that they are perceived to just be too big to fail. Like that's what we hear, or, you know, that that was a response here in Australia, that well, better be careful with how you you know how you deal with the banks because everybody's pension is invested in the banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's too important for the stock market. Is is that just one of the problems that that? You know, what, what does that even mean, too big to fail? Does that mean too big to be held to account? Yeah. I, th I mean, I think this is the root of that impunity that we spoke about. 
um, the idea that some folks can you know, simply get away with it um, is at the root cause of the, the continuation of, of, of many of those, um, of many of the problems we see. And I think that's where we need a new kind of imagination. It has to be that, I'm not suggesting that one wants those banks themselves necessarily to fail because ultimately they also hold the money if they, unless they're the, you know, the big, so Credit by Glassberg is one of those, it's a, it's, a, it's a private wealth bank. So it generally holds the money offshore of many wealthy people who I would argue probably some of them may or may not want to pay tax in their own country. But other banks um, also hold the money of private depositors of you and I, and I, I don't think one wants to harm the interests of ordinary people um, in, in many countries. But we certainly, I think, to rest in punity, have to see a process that the direct directors of these companies who are implicated and where there's proof and evidence shown through the work of the criminal justice system that they go to prison. Mm -hmm. You can't, and I think there's no, there's no greater fear from, from there's two, and interacting with many very wealthy, including wealthy South Africans, when writing this book. The fear of prison is there, the fear that somebody would hold some of those folks to account, and it's the fear of their own legacy being tarnished. I mean, I think the ego of some of the people, despite their fabulous wealth, many plutocrats are very, they see themselves as very fragile people. And that's something we, I think, need to ensure the criminal justice system starts to be right uh, in, in holding them to account. And so, and that requires the imagination to see that it's not about making the banks fail. We can preserve um, the institutions that change the way they act by, by holding their leadership to account in a, in a proper manner. Uh, we'll ask one first, I'll see if there's any others, and people have a question. Uh, last year, uh, Mr. Peter, in, uh, an, an investigative journalist in South Africa, released a book called Republic of Gupta, uh, State Network. So, after reading that book, what I found in that, and after going through your presentation, that the deep network in South Africa is still present. May not be the transnational corporations, but maybe the individual companies or individual corporations. So, how do you assess the situation of South Africa now? in respect of these individual companies or the individual persons which are actually holding the entire economy, <coughs> the entire nation under their hold. Do you want to take a few more? Uh, maybe see the others, I think. Yeah. Just so that I don't speak too much and then <coughs> yeah, like you've been shortchanged. We've got two over here. Unless it's not one of the others. Sorry. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I just ha wanted to, the first question you, the last question that you just asked and you were answering is, um, these corporations need to be held to account and that you've found a lot of evidence behind this. Have you put this evidence to any global organization that would actually be pursuing accountability and justice? Um, yeah, and I suppose, is there a statute of limitations around the evidence you found and that it, if it was intelligence that it's been uh, now released? So, thank you. Uh, yes, so my question actually is really closely related. <coughs> I was just going to say, um, yeah, I, I'd be interested to understand what you've done with all of the fascinating evidence that you've uncovered through your research. Um, what legal avenues have you pursued, uh, if, if you have, um, to, to get accountability for what's happened? So, so should we answer those and then have one? Yeah, my my question is related as well. Okay. So it's on the issue of accountability. So you, you, you connected um, the banks, the flow of funds, um, the armaments industry, and governments outside of South Africa. And we know that uh, a lot of banks are regulated, or they should be, mm -hmm. and the regulatory regimes report to government. We know that the arms industry in a number of big countries, you mentioned France, Israel, and a number of others, they work very closely with governments. Um, and so we then have, um, I would imagine, collusion, which you evidence between a number of governments, uh, governments and South Africa. So in a context of accountability, when um, there is a, um, almost a collusion within countries, between governments, how does one ever hold the people involved to account? 
Um, thank you. Those are all great questions. Um, so let me start, if I can, um, with a question around South Africa today. And uh, we, have, we haven't speak much about that. Um, so currently, so we've had a period of what is referred to as state capture in South Africa. And it was a really interesting, for me it was really interesting undertaking this investigation. I worked on different corruption scandals and cases in South Africa with colleagues. But for us, bringing out a book about something that happened 25 years ago in the midst of um, you know, this, the revelations that the state has effectively been captured by a small corrupt network, uh, let me just say it was kind of difficult uh, as well because there was some pushback. Are you trying to detract from accountability, you know, accountability measures now? Are you working for Jacob Zuma? And people tend to forget the last piece of work you worked on you know, where we were exposing Zuma and other things. Um, but the story is, for those who don't know, and, uh, a, the story is it's known perhaps in South Africa and around the world. It's this small group of uh, family, Gupta, the Gupta family from India arrived in South Africa with not much cash in the mid-1990s, soon after the dawn of democracy, set up shops, started doing business, and quickly befriended South African politicians. And one of the people that were important in their network in the late uh, 2010s was a man by the name of Jacob Zuma. And Zuma, in a classic kind, kind of patronage network system, they started to do favors for the his son and others around him, and very quickly, and the, the nation was astounded that um, cabinet members were effectively being appointed by this family. So people would go to meetings with Guptas and they would be told, well, we're basically interviewing you to become a cabinet me uh, member. And it showed that uh, Zupta, uh, the, well, they were known Zupta's, but that Jacob Zuma rather had abdicated seemingly some of his responsibilities to this family. And this was the exchange for cash. It was really Zuma's downfall that, um, that, that brought um, uh, that was, you know, that this particular case. And it's a focus right now in South Africa of a commission of inquiry, headed by uh, the Deputy Ju Justice of our Constitutional Court, Raymond Zondo, the Zondo Commission, as it's known, a bit like a royal commission, but different, because it happens at a time that most of the, the prosecuting authority and, that, and the, the agencies responsible for in the criminal justice sector of dealing with corruption, um, as I pointed out, have, have you know, the heads of those institutions of all being Zuma lackeys appointments that were there to ensure that he and others were not held to account. So the commission is the space in which we hope we can provide at some real truth telling. At the same time, Soro Ramaphosa um, himself, a very wealthy man from business, uh, billionaire, has gone about appointing, and for this I give him and his administration credit, of trying to appoint credible people in the prosecuting authority and elsewhere, giving them the powers to tackle this corrupt network. And clearly this network didn't arrive on its own. We can show that it needed HSBC, it was an important bank in the value chain. It allowed money for the corrupt procurement of locomotives from China, from uh, South China and uh, North China Rail, for South Africans. These were state owned enterprises procuring these goods. But HSBC should have detected the movement of money and didn't. South African Bank, Medbank, the Bank of Baroda, State Owned Bank in India, these are all important nodes. KPMG, it's very clear, KPM, the head of KPMG cha chairperson has admitted they were part and parcel of the corrupt system. KPMG signed off on audits, and because they played both the role of accountant and advisor to some of these deals, um, should have raised the flag a long time ago, together with McKinsey. So many of these global corporations were part and part of the system that has resulted probably uh, in an additional two million South Africans finding themselves in poverty over the last five years. Not out of poverty, but pushed into poverty. And so those are, we talk about the human rights impacts um, of corruption. So that work is ongoing, we're involved in that and others, and I, you know, I think this is the long, hard slug, sl slog of rebuilding um, the system, I mean the system of accountability in South Africa. Uh, but you know, we, we would argue that we've got to see this thing in its, it's not just taking the bit that's the right now, but it's trying to figure out what the long, longer shadow is, who those networks are, if we're going to stop this um, from recurring. So maybe if I can come to the to the other questions. Um, and so uh, the, the questions around, um, I think there was a question firstly around accountability for some of the actors that we focused on. While these processes are ongoing, one of the things that we've been looking at is 
we haven't been able, we haven't had a credible head of our prosecuting authority. So right now we're working on preparing potentially a docket which will go to our prosecuting authority to take this evidence to them and try and potentially and this I guess is written in part as a way to see if we can uh, ensure that there are some investigations. Um, last year, together with the Center for Applied Legal Studies at Fitz University in Johannesburg, we went to um, the, uh, use an, an OECD mechanism, the National Con Contact Point Mechanism, which I think you have in Australia as well, which requires every country to investigate allegations of human rights violations, which NGOs like ourselves can bring. Those we took to the National Contact Points in Belgium and Luxembourg. I do fear that in both countries, that is where dreams go to die. Mm -hmm. um, and very clearly, uh, you know, the amount of resistance we've seen, we've uncovered conflicts of interest in Belgium within the National Contact Point where the bank which we investigated is effectively one of the co-deciders of whether this issue can even proceed to an investigation. So it took, should take them three months to do this, it's taken them 12 months. I see very little remedy. So we are exploring the possibility of litigation in South Africa, um, and potentially against the banks as well. They know that, um, and so we've had some you know, furious debt, debt exchanges. And we've also done other things in South Africa, similar to the Russell Tribunal in Palestine, we organized the People's Tribunal uh, on Economic Crime, the first of its kind in the world last year. A group of six other South African civil society organizations said, if the prosecuting authorities and others fail us, we brought together judges and we presented the evidence of those economic crimes over a five-day period. And I, I would argue that in, in you know, where there is impunity like this, we should be able to create parallel mechanisms even through the, you know, to create the reenactment of justice, it's not, we, it's not formal, it doesn't, it's non-binding, non but we send the message that nobody should tell us, like the corrupt needs to do, that there is no evidence. The evidence is there, we just don't have the people in power to, who are able to, to do something with that. In terms of the statute of limitations, it is a problem that we face with. I think the, you know, with, with fraud and corruption and money laundering, it's a particular problem. With this case, it's different. We're dealing with a grave crime, which is the crime of apartheid, um, and so um, that gives us some leeway, and we have argued, um, uh, because in South African law, at least, this, we've only been able to reveal this in the last two years to the public, so we're still within, effectively, the, 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 you know, the statute of limitations, that period has just opened. So we don't have much time now to act, and we've been, you know, we've been pushing as hard as we can, but we are looking uh, at ensuring that, that, uh, that something is done. The question around you know, how do we deal with the collusion between the powerful, I think, is, is a really important one, and it's one I struggle to, to find an answer to. I think part of that is the pure process of unearthing, investigating, exposing. Um, you know, the difficulty when we look at those, those actors, it's an incredibly hard, it's a hard area to investigate. It's, I'll be honest, at moments it's, uh, yeah, I mean, one shouldn't, we shouldn't be brazen about it. It's, sometimes it's very, it is very intimidating work. Um, but I, I think that as a first step, it's about exposing some of this because, you know, the more we looked at this, we realized why Dulce September's murder has never been properly investigated, even in France, by the authorities. When we saw the, the fingerprints of French politicians and the intelligence services, all over, and I mean, I don't mean on one instance, this was systemic in its nature. Um, and that, I think, means, it, it does mean that the work of investigators, investigative journalists, that working together with you know, lawyers and others is so crucial. And in this case and other cases like, and I really uh, you know, stress that, there's so many other cases. There are the supply of weapons illicitly in Yemen right now that are, are leading potentially to the loss of tens of thousands of people's lives. Are we doing enough to investigate it, to expose the corporations that are involved and use, find ways to use our laws or change our laws through the new jurisprudence to do that? And I, I really, you know, I mean, f I keep on making that point because I think we, in a way, are fighting the impossible. Uh, I don't think it's impossible, but I, I feel like we're pushing back against something that's much bigger than us. But, but I guess that's, that's also our responsibility. Okay, um, it, is, it is past seven o'clock, so I do have to bring the proceedings to an end. Um, one more question. Uh, one, more, one more question. You, you did actually have two, sir, so yeah. maybe we'll go and with one last one. Yeah. Oh, was there another? Okay. I'll be short. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll go with the last two questions. I didn't get to see that. Okay. Um, so we'll go with the last two questions, and um, apologies for going over time. But it's not my fault. <laughs>
Democrat, that's why. <laughs> so, uh, so, South Africa is still one of the leading economic powerhouses in Africa. But if this is the situation in South Africa, what is your state of opinion about the potential nodes or the potential countries, which is becoming a hotspot for these corporations and human rights violations? I know for sure about Mauritius because I work there and from that place, and I know it is a front of all money laundering operations in the world. Having said that, what, in your opinion, are the potential countries right now in Africa which is evol involving in these issues? Thanks, Henny. My experience is I've been investigating and prosecuting crimes related to these types of battles. Um, the big difficulty is proving the intent of the corporate official. So, in the materials that you've uncovered in the archives, what because, because obviously you can prove uh, if you look at criminal responsibility, the connections and the flows of money and arms. But the big question is, can you prove the intent? And that is the perennial problem in proving cases against corporate officials. Um, so have you found material, relevant material, in those archives that would establish intent? Because that's what your local prosecuting authorities and any international prosecuting authorities would really be looking for. Great, thanks. So I'll, I'll briefly try and answer both of those. Um, I mean, I think, I, I think I keep on arguing, you know, it's really interesting. If you ask South Africans, they, you tell them what you do. My response uh, is often, oh, well, you've got to have a lot to do, or we live in the most corrupt country in the world. But when I travel to Tanzania or Kenya or any other country, uh, we off, I often hear the same thing. And increasingly, if you travel to, I don't know, you know, Germany or the United States, depends on who you speak to, you have folks saying something quite similar. So I think that uh, the African continent has um, unique problems in terms of resource extraction and the role of, uh, I guess, corrupt political uh, actors in some countries. But what we face is the global nature of this problem. The United Kingdom is a good example of a country which, you know, there's a declaration that the beneficial owners of companies Will, uh, will be made public by an investigation by the, uh, the non-profit organization Global Witness last week showed that there are literally hundreds of thousands of companies where the benef beneficial owners of those companies, in fact, can't be proven that are all based in the city of London. Um, so I think it's the international nature of those flows. The importance of this particular case of the banks that I showed you was, in a way, it portended what was to come. It was at the beginning of the hyper-financialization uh, globally, of the ability to move money around the world, set up front companies, and if anything, you know, this has we just you know we just revved the system up over the last decades, and and um, yeah, so I, I guess I answer that by saying I, you know I really think when we my my answer would be sure Mauritius I think there are questions to ask about its role as a centre for money laundering in an African or Indian Ocean context. But um, there are just so many other jurisdictions where we have this, precisely the same problem. And until we have an agreement on issues around beneficial ownership, uh, where we can have transparency around that, um, until we are able to stop the, 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 the incredibly quick movement of money in terms of capital flights and the movement of profits offshore, and, and ensure that taxes stay in countries where they need to focus and fund social justice issues in our countries, I don't think that you know, we're even close to dealing with it, and, and so I, I see it really as, as global in nature, and, and therefore we need to be thinking along those uh, lines. The question around um, intent, um, in this particular case, is, is, an, is an interesting one, and it was one that you know, when we sat down with many lawyers that we've been working with, keep on asking us more or less the same question. What we did find in some of the documents, you know, they were good, not, they were just scraps of material, but on some of the, um, the, the the, the fraudulent end user certificates. So if you wanted to, what you do is you, you exporting weapons to South Africa, you go to, the Ni to a corrupt official in Nigeria or Germany or wherever, and you basically get them to give an end use certificates to show that those weapons are going from Australia to Nigeria or Germany. And some of those, the purchases of those end use certificates had the, show that they went to bank accounts in those banks that we, fo that we were focusing on. But importantly, we also have affidavits from former officials that work for the South African state-owned arms company, Armscore. And they, they, they 
you know, they were they tell the story of how frequently they go to the bank, who the, the names of officials that dealt with the bank, who I try to myself to contact uh, contact and speak to, um, and so those are real live human beings. Um, uh, in addition to the role of the top management, sub general support for the apartheid system, and I think once we pull that together, um, there's a quite a I think there's a quite a compelling argument to be made in terms of not only the intent, but I think it gives us a good sense of the kind of profit that the, these kind of corporations made during that period. And, and I think that's precisely why we would argue cases like these are potentially some of the test cases, um, you know, one of those mm -hmm. of holding uh, actors who've been involved in grave crimes to account. And I'll end off by just saying, if we, the, the issues of intent are often asked and, and others, but if we, if, we, you know, if we really look back over the last 60 years, if we look back to the European Holocaust in, in, in the 1940s, the banks that were complicit, not the banks that held the money of Jewish claimants, where they were basically shamed by the American government and Bill Clinton into paying money in Switzerland back, but the banks that were very central to assisting the, the, the Nazi party and the Nazi regime to, you know, to undertake the transactions it did. None of those banks have been uh, taken to, none of them have been held successfully to account. I think, you know, when it comes to, that I'm aware of, uh, speaking to some scholars working on this, so I think that we have um, a long legacy, again, of impunity, and, and I think this is, um, this is the narrative we have to work at changing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, at that point, um, I, I will bring things to an end, but you may be here for a few more minutes if you uh, <coughs> want to um, talk personally to Henny. Uh, before um, I close, uh, I might just draw your attention to some of the materials you have on your chair. You have a flyer about uh, the book, um, Apart by Guns and Money, which is, we've got a copy, <coughs> we've got a copy up on the table up here. Uh, we also have a flyer for the Caston Centre Annual Conference, which uh, is, um, is always um, a fabulous day uh, with uh, great speakers and um, I think a really, really um, great atmosphere. Uh, that's going to be on the 26th of July. For those of you who normally come to the conference this year, please note we do have a change of venue. Um, we are going to be down at the NAB building in um, Docklands, so um, uh, please take that flyer and please do come along. And then finally I should draw attention that we've only recently, we've just recently um, started our annual appeal uh, for the Caston Centre. And so if you are able, we would ask if you can possibly donate. We are a small organisation and we try to have a big impact. And um, in particular we try and bring you some great speakers. Um, and for a long time now we've been doing that for free. Which does bring me to our speaker tonight, uh, Mr Henny Van Veren. Uh, with a, I, I think, a compelling account of of how you know corruption, um, how corruption, you know, how how massive human rights abuses can be built on top of corruption. I mean, you you mentioned then the Holocaust, and then of course more recently apartheid, and then it continues today to be fueling wars, um, too many wars around the world. Uh, will you please join me in thanking Henny Van Veren? <laughs>